house is a machine for living in. Baths, sun, hot water, cold water, warmth at will, conservation of food, hygiene, beauty in the sense of good proportion. An armchair is a machine for sitting in. And so on. There's, 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 there's like an obvious side to that, isn't there? And a complicated bit. You can cut this and put it somewhere else, but I just had the thought. Um, which is, how does a machine for living in hot water, cold water, etc. make sense? It's like the application of services to an environment. But also, the machine that produces beauty, that produces the good life, in some deep sense. And that, I think, gets to a... What's the word? You know, an inattention in Corbusier generally, which is his love of the engineering and the engineer, but he is always willing, it's always sacrificing the practical at the, at the expense of the aesthetic. There's a problem with the statement in, I forget whether it's in urbanism or in um, Towards New Architecture, that the engineer calculates the load on a beam and then specifies the ratio of its depth to height guided by spirit, which is that actually that's not what drives functionalist aesthetics it's the other way around the spirit drives you calculate (laughs) and the machine for living he lists the machine things and then he says beauty he is interested in the practical and his practical ideas aren't ridiculous the idea of mass production machine the sort of second industrial revolution interchangeability the designs adopted from liners lots of little bits pop out of liners and but he's on a, on a sacred quest to truth, really. They're just two sides of the same thing that's an inherent contradiction. But it's, not a, it's, just, it's a fruitful contradiction. Yeah. You are listening to About Buildings and Cities. I'm George Gingell. I'm Luke Jones. And welcome, welcome back to another podcast about Le Corbusier. We don't know if this is... This is probably number four. Yeah. We were a bit too drunk <laughs> for some, some of the others. <laughs> yeah, occasionally we record one which is a write-off. Le Corbusier's work with Les Brunovaux and his collaboration with Amadeo aux Enfants, uh, covered in our last episode, gave him an introduction to a group of wealthy and influential patrons for whom he would build a series of daring new houses and villas during the 1920s, in the process defining both an, a visual style the abstract, white, geometric aesthetic of international modernism, and also a vision of the nature of modern dwelling, the house, as we heard, as a machine for living. And we're going to discuss a selection of these 1920s villas uh, over probably more than one episode. There are a lot of... We're not going to talk about all of them. No, we're leaving a lot out. I haven't come across a survey series of lectures on architecture that does not discuss more than one of them. Well, should we begin at the beginning? I mean, actually, the first, the first villa that we should discuss is, uh, was not built, but is a hypothetical project uh, displayed in the Salon d'Automne in uh, 1922, the Maison Citrohan, or Citru- Citruang, or something. I don't, I don't really know what it's the... A, di- it's a pun. Why didn't you explain the pun? The pun is it sounds like Citruang, the car. Yeah, but also... Uh, what, what else does it sound There's like? There's something else. It's like a mashup of two things. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't get it. I don't get it. But it's um, it's 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 a you know it's a model for an ideal single family house, uh, and the model still exists or else has been remade, probably more likely. But um, you can see the thing which was displayed. It was this big big model. The Salon d'Automne is like a, a a bit like the RA Summer Show or you know one of these annual art and design shows which is still going on in fact um i don't really know what the rules for admission were or any of that kind of thing doesn't matter but he got it in there um so do we want to say anything about it yeah several things the first one is that it is to an extent an evolution of the domino house there is an exception here which is that the concrete posts are in the wall but it's the same sort of system building the second thing which is really key is it's the first i think full-fledged implementation of the classic Corbusian aesthetic. White rendered walls with black window frames, Hmm. which are portrait strips divided into verticals with black frames, black banisters, circulation set off, roof terrace, carport. Yeah. Put into the plan of the building such that a certain chunk of the building is suspended. 
So to describe in very simple diagrammatic kind of terms how it works, the building's got a four-storey bit at the back, which has all of the normal houses and rooms and things. Then it has another bit on the front, which is double height, which is a big living area. If you look at it from the side, the double height living area is one floor off the ground, leaving a gap underneath the car park and a gap on top of it for the roof terrace. So it's very simple. And there are various stories of where he got the idea from. The obvious precedents in artist studios, which have been around for a long time. It's also said to be a restaurant that he used to go to, which had a similar sort of thing. I'm not sure. There's some very very obvious things, which is that the double height space is the height of uh, an industrial unit. And the construction technique is similar to that in industry. And the windows are sort of similar. And there are also bits of the aesthetic which are borrowed from ocean liners. An ocean liner really is a machine for living in. It's sort of got decks, right? It's got decks. It's got that the material finishes the white. The um, the there's a lower level. Well, there's a kind of first floor balcony which sticks out, which is articulated very much like uh, like, well, not quite the prow of a ship, more the back of a ship, gallery or something, or or like a a section of the side promenade that is on the front of um towards architecture, towards an architecture. So there's a model of it, but there are also lots and lots of these rather um lovely sketches and drawings of it in different landscapes he puts it in different parts of the world goes on a little holiday it does it drives around the world you know we see it in this rather sort of flat arid looking field we see it on a little hummock overlooking the sea and various other places i think part of it is that that like him it's it's um it's monocular it's got this little porthole over the front the sort of door uh, onto the front balcony which which gives it this little little kind of face another marine touch but also uh, it's worth saying this is part of the general part of his propaganda drive he's come to paris again he's got the backing of those enfants for his new world order and for himself and it's working it works it yeah. starts working after this it starts working he publishes he's, get, he's about to publish uh, vers une architecture and within a year of that the office is full of work there are loads of rich people who want fancy houses from him. Yeah. The mainstay of the early to mid-career architect. He's gone into partnership with his cousin, and they very quickly hire first four, then eight people, and then more, yeah. and uh, start churning out rich people's houses. Well, yeah, so it gets exhibited at this um, salon, and actually he does get a job straight out from a guy called Georges Besnus, who comes to see it and says, can you build me a house like that? And this is a house which you're not really going to talk about, called uh, Maison... Uh, it's called, like, Care Carré or something. It's yeah. got some weird ac- acronym. It's a funny little box... It's kind of like it's kind of like Citroen, but it's like Citroen. slightly more it's compromised. Been sort of pulled out. The parts have been pulled out a bit. It's not such a kind of integrated, sealed little box. There's more expression. Citroen is very much um, a unit amongst many. It feels it's quite contained. It's um, it has various things that can't don't really swing in houses for rich people. A house for a rich person designed by an architect must have a degree of um, the expression, the sort of extrovert expression and flair of the patron, whereas Citroën's is a little sort of nice box. I think it's only worth mentioning at all for two reasons. One is that, um, as with many of these clients, they first go shopping for sites, actually, before designing the house. And one of the sites which is rejected by Besnus is later bought by Aux Enfants for, the house, uh, for a house for himself. And the other is that it establishes... Uh, absolutely characteristic feature of these um, of these projects, which is that they fail in technical terms spectacularly and almost at once. And so there are all of these letters from Besnus to Corbusier detailing all of the things which have gone wrong. If we forget to mention it with any of the villas, you can assume that water is dripping down all the walls, they're freezing cold, the windows don't close, there's mould everywhere, that sort of thing. In general, all the mechanisms break. Are there any exceptions to this? Uh, I don't know of any. No, I think all, I think of, all, all of them, them go seriously wrong. <laughs> I think it's I think it's I, it, it's probably the flat roofs. To be honest, I think people yeah. it took a long time for people to be good at flat roofs. Flat roofs is a big source of failure. The um, also five meter ceiling height is difficult to heat. Yeah, without any insulation and yeah. lots and lots of single paned windows. That's yeah. quite cold. 
the new sort of swing windows, um, which are just made by people on site, often bend out of shape and don't close. Oh, uh, yeah. Those. Everything has got single, everything has got central heating, uh, and that never works as well. Those are, so uh, essentially the, the new technologies he's introducing, they don't work because it, they all really require factories. Or like EDPM rubber or something yeah. for the roof. Lovely, yeah, lovely EDPM rubber will solve everything. It's great stuff. Do you want to, I've got a, I've got a quote from, um, from a letter. Furthermore, and this is serious, again, because you did not in the beginning cement render the cellar, and because the repairs which you carried out two years ago were probably inadequate, here is my garage once again flooded with my suitcases and bottles swimming in water. A fine state of affairs, you'll agree. And this entitles me with one thing and another to cry out more than ever. How on earth was my house constructed? And by whom? Does this ever stop? Maybe after the war. Certainly before there's some great... There's much more terrifying things than that. There's like huge sheets of plate glass popping out onto the street. Yeah. Ready to to slice someone in half, yeah. One of the sites which Besnus and Corbusier looked at together around the end of 1922 was... Uh, bought by Amade Ozonfant, who was himself in search of a house. Initially, the brief was for a family house. Uh, at that, Funny. At that point. He's just getting divorced. He, he freed himself of those entanglements. In its sort of later and built versions, it became a brief for a house and studio for himself in his new bachelor lifestyle. I know it's not the first house, but it feels like it should be. It has several characteristics that I'll start out with. It's on the corner of a street, sort of. Yeah, it's in it's in the city. Very much. Uh, it's in a funny little nest of little streets. Yeah, so that while while we've talked about this episode as the villas, this is that's the one thing this isn't is a villa. Townhouse. Yeah, tall and thin. When you look at it from the street, the house reads as having a completely square plan. What you don't realise from the street is that it, on one side it continues a bit further backwards, so it's actually a kind of rectangle which has been cut off a bit on one corner. But from the street it reads very clearly as these two equal facades around a right-angled corner. In this house, the uh, the kind of industrial inspiration of the new aesthetic, the engineer's aesthetic, comes through in this very, uh, very clearly in this what's almost a, a kind of quotation isn't it the the it has this double pitched industrial roof line right on the top this little sawtooth profile yeah so this is used to let in consistent north light um can we go through the building from the bottom up yeah so people understand at the bottom there's um a little sort of carporty bit yeah there's a tiny little flat for his manservant as well. Yeah, there's a, yeah, the little you know your your little manservant in the in the lower depths. From the outside, you read this stacking very clearly. So the bottom bit is sort of is the uh, you know has a few windows and a garage. And then there are two layers of the standard strip of two layers of sort of Citroen building. No, only one. Only one. Only one. Yeah, one only one, one floor of that. So uh, lo- oh, that's lo- true. Yes. Oh, so yeah, there's, a, there's a strip of a strip of window, a kind of strip window, which is the which is the private aux enfants, um, which has got floor. Um, the bathroom and bedroom in it. it uh, fairly modest, no reception rooms. It's like a little utility flat, and then above that is a room which is mainly a very tall, kind of double to triple height space, with uh, a large bit of frosted glass ceiling. Above which is this um, sawtooth roof line, which lets in northern light, and two big windows on the corner, huge windows. Yeah. And in that is a little mezzanine reached by a staircase, which has a tiny little sort of monk's cell in it. At the back of the space, there's one mezzanine, underneath which is a dark room, and on top of which there's another space, another kind of art space with the full height window looking out the back. Yeah, in the corner of the main room looking out onto the street, there is what reads as a cube, a sort of cube of light, or sort of three faces of a cube, but giving giving the impression of a of a cube. And then, yes, yeah, hidden on one side of that, there's this thing which looks a little bit like a bird box. It's like yeah. a little box with Treehouse. a little... Uh, yeah, with a little door and a, 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 something which is more like a ship's ladder than a real stair. It's very steep going up and into it, and which has no... Once the door closes, it's completely cut off, and it just has one tiny little window um, out into the street. That's this. That's the studio, obviously. That's the studio yeah. space. Yes, in theory, the big room is the atelier. 
it's the painting room. In reality, I think it's sort of a reception room. It's really the, the sort of party living room. It's huge and cool. And that's the inside and the outside. Yeah, it's it's uh, the the other thing that we said is it's got that sawtooth on it, which looks really uh, striking. Yeah. The photo uh, the photographs of the interior almost only ever show the interior of the big atelier room, what, and there will usually be one looking at these two huge glass windows and the frosted glass bit of ceiling and the bird's nest, the little or the little um, monk cell on sticks, and then that combined with a single photograph down the street showing the sawtooth roof line, the strip windows, the little carport, is the conventional presentation of it. In fact, it doesn't look like this anymore because there was a subsequent extension and roof terrace built on top. I'm not quite sure when that happened. but Well, I think there are different things to talk about, aren't there? I mean, as a, as a house, you can see it's been very sort of precisely tailored for a certain sort of lifestyle. Shag pad. It's a one-bed house with uh, room for one manservant as well. Yeah. Or bachelor pad, anyway. Yeah, I mean, I really like... I think the studio is a really, really great space. And I, the you can see, yes, this sort of um, monkish fascination he has with the space for study, the, yeah. the the cell for study. So one of the things which is nice about the way the studio space works is the way that it's this big unified space with a, a kind of mezzanine. But it, it does create these different areas of focus and, and scales and things. So there's a space underneath the monk cell, which has a little fireplace underneath it. This this one bit of the room where the ceiling is lowered, uh, he creates this this slightly kind of cosy... Cosy corner. Cosy corner scale. And that also means that the chimney will warm the, um, the writer's cell on the way up. Also, the shape of the room, the shape of the room is really cool. The main bit of it is a square, but then there's the, all the, so this, this sort of strange leftover bit, which more, almost doubles the size of it. Yeah, I, well, I was going to talk about the like the monkish dream cell because it's very carefully considered. When you look at the when you look at the facade, you see the enormous square window of the studio, and then there's the tiny square window of the monk's cell next to it. Mm. Obviously, they relate to each other due to some diagonal lines yeah, 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 uh, yeah, drawn yeah. all the things. Oh yeah, no, uh, there are lots of those drawings around. That was the place where you need to go and think. I've got a lot of sympathy with that. I really I feel like my life is missing some kind of space which is going to give me focus clarity the light of heaven understanding all of that yeah it's a really nice house yeah. it's got it, it it this is something that will come up again and again in the houses that the sensibility Corbusier's sensibility is to have the living quarters moderate like like reasonably provisioned but moderately austere actually like and pretty simple so, subject subject to the insistence of clients that they don't live like monks but it, it, where where possible, he will persuade them that they, that that, that you know the sort of day to day bathroom bedroom sort of block is quite ordinary, and then separated from that will be the self expression rooms. Yeah, and in a way, that, um, the flats and things are just that monk bit separated off. So what makes it from one of his standard units to a villa is that it will have a great wing of atelier, reception room, art gallery. Sculpture studio, complicated set of roof terraces. I mean, and that's, I think that's true in basically all of the early villas. Yeah. All of the early villas are like that, and they're for pretty, pretty rich people. Um, they could have what they wanted. The, another idea which is, which is kind of taking shape in this house um, is that circulation becomes very st- sort of stressed, and that the, the, what circulation can do to the experience of rooms. Um, starts to be investigated. In fact, I think this has been true from his very early... Even from the Maison Blanc of his parents. The circulation, both through the landscape and the building, the the creating of views in that, you know, free building. You know, when we went to the Red House, right at the yeah. beginning, before we'd even started, you're always looking through one corridor to another one yeah. at a high level. You're going round and up and experiencing... He's framing... He's framing square spaces at odd angles, looking through into another square space that allows... Which actually, again, this is the aspiration of Pliny. He's always banging on about it. You've always got to like look through, have a wander through, and you look through from one square space into another square, square space, creating a dynamism, and a dynamism across levels between them. This is something that, that marks out Corbusier's architecture from his like, late teens... Yeah, no, I think it's absolutely true, and it's also it's it's an interesting thing which I think um, 
if you do a design for someone for a house or whatever you try and and you're trying to explain it to them often this is the thing which people don't intuitively grasp it's very it's, hard to read in plans yeah the transitions the like the real pleasure of space is the transitions and the mo- the seeing between and the moving between spaces and it's not it's not it's not just being in a room whereas i think people are imagining that they're going to have a lovely room and they're going to sit in the lovely room but really yeah, it's, it, which so is the, uh, again, that. going back to our back catalogue, the uh, Warpole approach is you design a load of cool rooms and you don't really care about uh, the consequences between them are accidental. And that's sort of the consumer approach to architecture. And I think this is the driver of his virtuosity in these schemes is his ability to understand the mobile human viewpoint and to control it and to guide it through these boxes so the circulation in the ozon studio is that there is um there's a single story spiral staircase which is at, on the outside of the building which takes you from the ground floor up directly into the first floor sort of residential bit there's a circulation sort of buried in the middle of the plan which goes all the way from the top to the bottom and then there are these various stairways and ladders and things within the the space of the studio so it's not we're not quite at the full kind of architectural promenade which we're going to see demonstrated in some projects which he would be working on within the next year. But there are these moments, for example, the sort of route from your front door down the staircase onto the street, or these routes, ar- the way you arrive up into the studio in the middle of the f- floor, all these kind of... And the high, he, he, like within a not very deep plan, manages to separate sort of ceremonially different stairs. So you have a stair which essentially just takes you into the building, avoiding the service parts, and then you move across the plan to enter the kind of axial elevator which takes you up one level, and then you can move across the plan again, and each of these is... One is taking you from outside to inside, one is taking you from living quarters to social quarters, one is taking you from the studio to paradise or whatever and the transformation from inside to outside is very different from work to paradise yeah and each of those has got a sort of movement backwards and forwards and they're in a different state of light uh within a shallow sort of corner site that's really the best you can do i think with stairs across that many floors that's the game you can play is you can kind of move it forward and backward and make the stair small and big and light and dark that's yeah. That's the limit of my understanding, anyway, of what you can do in that sort of small corner side. Yeah. And it's a it's a sort of stair game that I think is, is is like innate to that sort of site. Yeah. And he's a master of it. I think I like this house so much as well because it's it's uh, very urban. Its verticality is urban. The way it plays with uh, these different approaches to the win- you know the windows, the articulation of the relationship between inside and outside on the different levels, um, the way it uses its corner site. And then, to be honest, I would kind of like... I think I just actually rather like this iconographic uh, pointy roof thing that he's put on as well. I think that, that um, it's on the verge of being a tiny bit kitsch, but, like, just in the right degree, actually. It, I think what holds it back from being really kitsch is that it has the proportions of a townhouse, and it still understands itself as a townhouse. It's not a Corbusian block. It's no. and it and, and that, that movement of stairs and things, that's all a very established this is this goes back to as soon as you start building this sort of city and people have got money to build their own houses. It un, it understands itself in that trope. Within quite a short period of time he would be building a house for a man called Raoul Laroche, who was a, a, a banker. He was, in terms of his lifestyle, very similar to Aux Enfants a bachelor living with a single manservant. Um, he, I think... And a pile of cash. And a big pile of cash. <laughs> um, <laughs> he, uh, relatively young. Uh, he was a big collector of art, and he'd come into contact with the two of them first, in fact, because he'd asked them to buy some paintings for him from uh, Picasso and other artists, which they managed to do successfully on rather on the cheap. I think, actually, they'd sort of met at, um, in the art circle and had been talking about things, and Corbusier had suggested that um, another art dealer who he knew had gone bankrupt, and that they could all go to the... Um, to the fire sale. To the fire sale. Oh, excellent, yeah. Uh, and in exchange for this, 
he gave him a bra. Did he? Yeah. Oh, it's very nice. At least in the way that um, La Roche ta- tells it, he 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 then said, "Wouldn't you like a lovely house to put all of that art in?" Or words to that effect. And uh, and the the answer was yes. The, there's a slightly more complicated story to do with the site because in fact Corbusier and Genere had been involved on the site already. And he had as well. I think Roche had, but not as his house. Right. Yeah. It's a bit, it's a bit complicated. And I don't know how much we need to get into it, but there are some slightly juicy details. It's a suburban site. It's not suburban. Where where is it's it? It's completely urban. It's 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 in Paris proper. Is it in the 15th? Or it's that sort of bit. And it's a really strange urban site, because what it is is there's a block of tall, standard Paris sort of houseman... Yeah. ...tall houses, and the block is a little bit larger than normal, and there's a little gap down the middle, which effectively is that the gardens in these houses are slightly bigger than normal. Someone has managed to buy up the backs of the gardens and put a little private road down it, and it's that site... So it's sort of surrounded by trees, but it's in the middle of the city. Or it's, you know, it's in Paris, which is not a big... Paris is one of these cities where only really the centre is officially Paris. And so it's a very strange sort of site. It's the backs of all of these houses, and that really has a big effect on the design because they're building, like, a few metres away from all these the backs of all these people's houses. But it's built like... It's built superficially like a suburban villa. Yeah. That's why I said you should look up where the site is, because it's not where you think it is. No, it's not. (laughs) (laughs) There's a whole series. He'd done a a few... Property Bank had put together this site before. Nothing to do with them. Yeah. And suddenly bought and put in a private road. Or put in as a right to it. They managed to get together this unusual site. And he pitched to the bank who owned it a speculative proposal for four villas on the site. Nothing really like what was there. And I think... Roche was involved. And thereafter, there was a very complicated, uh, over quite a while, set of negotiations with who's going to buy the land, who's going to get the site, how many units are going to be on it, who the units are going to be for. He does some of his usual financial skullduggery, like effectively stealing the money given to him to buy one of the sites from from, from a from sort of friend and acquaintance. Lady. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Someone else manages to get a chunk of the site, so the site is reduced in width, and that's why there are two little funny houses on it which aren't anything to do with him. And it goes through various evolutions, and at the end, or like if we take it just one stop before the end, we have uh, three houses, which is a house for Roche, which is medium-sized, a granny annex, and strangely, a house for... Corb's brother. Albert. Albert. Uh, which is a small house, and they are effectively in an L shape. And at this point, there are various sort of different configurations being tried out, being the end of the L, the L bit. Yeah. And then there being a really small house and a sort of rectilinear house joined onto it to form the L. And it's this L sitting very tightly in between, in this blo- in this square block of houses with a tiny sort of where there's one missing house and you can get in on a private road. Components of the building were tried in different configurations and it ended with a bigger Roche house, Yeah. Um, which absorbed the granny annex, with the end of the wing being the sort of fancy receiving bit, the block being his house, and then that almost being mirrored with Corb's brother's house. One of the key ideas which is developed and articulated in the design of this house is the idea of the promenade architecturale, the architectural promenade. This is something that they wrote about the design of the house. This second house will be rather like an architectural promenade. You enter. The architectural spectacle at once offers itself to the eye. You follow an itinerary and the perspectives develop with great variety, developing a play of light on the walls or making pools of shadow. Large windows open up views of the exterior where the architectural unity is reasserted. Here, reborn for our modern eye, are architectural discoveries. The pilotis, the long windows, the roof garden, the glass facade. Once again, we must learn at the end of the day 
to appreciate what is available. The idea of the of the architectural promenade and of the views that it creates is particularly resonant because the kind of the dream of this house is so visual. It's it's a house for an art collector. It's a house for the display of art, and it's a house where there's this very direct connection between the display, the hang. You know, the hang is conceived as part of the design. When they do his bedroom, it's set out with where all of the art is going to go. And lots and lots of features of the design are explicitly designed uh, to act as a kind of counterpoint and surround for this very good collection of, uh, well, early 20th century uh, European painting. And we're going to do our best to describe what the house is like without going on and on and on for ages. Because it's, it's a complex... It's not got a lot of rooms, but they've got a lot of complexity. So do you them. want to describe up to the front door? OK, I'll get us in. You're in standard Paris. Lots of housemen, big, tall buildings. You go down the road... And there's a little gate between two tall buildings. Uh, and you go down this little private road, 50 yards. There's two houses not by him. And then you enter effectively a little cut-out courtyard, which has a little wall running all on one side. And there's this L of the building. And you're on the going along the long axis of it. On your right-hand side, there is what seems like a sort of small modernist block, beautifully proportioned, ahead of you, the building comes back, bulges out towards you, standing on thin posts, concrete posts. Under that, that there's a carport, and there's another carport to your right. And then along that, there are, on the ground floor, there's a rhythm of these sort of massive steel service doors, which go into, which are like, I think the pair of them is three and a half metres wide, which repeats. And then there's a pair of kind of ship-style front doors... Yeah. On that side, which almost gives the appearance of it being three buildings. Yeah. And it's got a lovely, beautifully proportioned facade, which you can look up. And also very orientated towards these cars driving in. It's very much an ocean liner. Very much an ocean liner with cars. Very much also using the extra bulk of his brother's house to sort of bulk up this long facade and create a mixture of symmetrical components offset with asymmetrical components. Let's say you've arrived by car. You walk in, you'll find yourself, you kind of pass under this, this sort of narrow uh, little bridge above you. Um, and then you enter a triple height space, which is going all the way up. And you'll see on your left a staircase, which will lead you up to first floor level, which is really the main level of the house. I think at that point you would have this sense of the building as having two halves, which are divided by the hall space. That on the right is the private house, within which, um, you know, similar to the Aux Enfants studio, it's actually another one-bed house um, of enormous proportions with a, a master bedroom uh, and, uh, you know, a dining room, an office, um, various other things, all with a, with a single stair, stairwell at the back of the plan, which leads all the way up. And on your left is the, um, it's the, the, the sort of the, the house for... The life of the mind, the house for partying, the house for all of the good things in life, which contains a library right on the very top floor, which is reached by this bridge, which you will have seen from below, um, and the, uh, one of the real show, the real showpiece space, which is this gallery, this room. You imagine a, a box, one wall of which has been sort of bulged outward so that it has a, a convex bulge underneath of which is the is the carport and which is entered actually from a ramp coming down from second floor level down to the the uh, the floor level of the gallery which is at first floor level um so that there's a kind of communication between uh between the two of them and the ramp hugs the convex curving wall so that it's curving on its way down at the end of which there's a tiny, like, smoking balcony type thing. Yeah. Um, which is quite fun. Yeah, jutting out over that there. That actually is a simplified version of the circulation. Yeah, I've got a couple of things wrong. but There's a lot of... Suffice to say, there's a lot of play of looking through staircases and ramps and access things. And we have a, the, like, bo library is like a box. Yeah. It's it's a big room pretending to be a tiny room on sticks, like the Ozon 4 house. It's it's a lot more that there are kind of two places where you have a core running up multiple floors. Yeah, it seems a bit over the top to have two staircases in a one-bedroom house. 
Oh, there are actually um, three staircases. <laughs> At the moment that you enter, you know, you enter a room which has two staircases leading directly opposite, fully opposite one another. But one is one is the stair which connects up vertically through the private house, and one is this public, much more exposed staircase which leads you up towards the uh, the library. What's the... Where's the staircase there? Oh, no, of course, you go around that way. It's great audio when we don't understand the yeah. plan ourselves. Yeah, yeah. The, the, rela- the way the, the, way the gallery works is quite complicated as well because I you don't it. actually just go down the, down the ramp. You, also go, you can also get down there from the left. I get it, yeah. The sense of the architectural promenade, you'd be going under this overhanging gallery box with its big distended belly on one side. You'd be going through the hall under the, the kind of the great triple height space, up a staircase which winds around on itself, then into the bottom of the gallery, and then up the ramp which runs up one wall of the gallery, up to the library, and then onto this little sort of Juliet balcony that's overlooking the big triple height space that you'd been in previously. That's the circulation. Combined with that is... So you've got the physical spaces. Combined with that is the circulation of light. There's a terrific constraint in where you can put windows Mm. in this building, which is that you can't really put any normal windows on the outside of the L. No. Because they're about four metres from the backs of people's houses, rich people's houses, on all sides. And, like, lawsuits are threatened. He keeps trying to do it. Uh, They keep writing to the mayor and the council, like, restraining orders, anger... He's like, this is useless, my vision is being impaired. Le Corbusier is not an architect who generally relishes constraint. No. But it does sometimes produce an interesting solution. And this was an extremely fraught design. The gallery had been at three different points in the building at different points. Yeah. Originally, the um, house, the locations of the house and the gallery were reversed. Yeah. But what that means is that you quite frequently in this get something which becomes an important trope of him, which is the high and very narrow clerestory window. Yeah. So the gallery is lit on the north side. So there's a clerestory window all along the non-ramp side. Uh, yeah, OK, the opposite side. And then there's a big window, but which is only in parts on the, other, on the, on the south side. So there's a, there's a continuous north window, which lets in a, a wash light like a continuous blue wash light. And then you've got two focal windows, which let in, let in focal, focused southern light. And the pictures, I th- the pictures, I think, hang on the straight wall, don't they? While you, you circulate well, up um, and down the curvy wall. Well, look really preferred it for there only to be one or two pic- pictures. In yeah, yeah, yes. It was mostly about the architecture. He does, I mean, and he says that in um, there's the various other texts where he talks about how the proper way to appreciate art is to have all your pictures in a cabinet. And then, you know, in the evening, once you've dismissed the wife and servants and things, you take one out and you look at it on your own for a bit. Yeah. And then put it away again. This is sort of um, like Chinese... Yeah, like, like Chinese scrolls. You get, you get your scroll yeah. out and yeah. you'll, you'll talk about it over the port and cigars. And then yeah. you put it away. <laughs> um, yeah, he has a problem with people putting things on his white walls. Yeah, white walls that would soon be dripping in mildew. <laughs> yeah, so there were, like as 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 expected, a lot of things went quite seriously wrong on the technical side of this building. Um, we, before we talk about that, should we? Do we need to say anything more? There's the interesting play of light because of the way the south works. Yeah, the hard north wall, the reflection onto his brother's house, which is a sort of compact, modest. Oh, there's loads of stuff we haven't talked about, by the way. This thing has got two roof terraces, a sort of private roof terrace and a public roof terrace. The private roof terrace reflects into a roof terrace in Albert's house. In the, the circulation, which we've only really talked about the re- reception circulation, there is also a set of an entirely different circulation for the private life of the house. If we imagine the two halves, the private house and the public house... Um, and then there's this intrusion of the public into the private house, which is the dining room, which is sort of in the middle of the section of the private house. And then that has this little bridge, this little umbilicus, which connects the two together. And that's part of the of the promenade as well, that you can cross over the big space. Yeah, the, there's, there's a complicated mediation between the public and private because it's there's, there's the void. Yeah. Uh, and there's also the sort of library block, which sits between, and there's the dining room. At the back of the private house, at the top of that circulation, is a terrace, 
and at the end of the other circulation is a terrace. Yeah. Both of them have. In a way, I think it's not a completely unconscious retelling of, if not a hotel particulier, then something like that, where then the you know this this classic tradition or or um Ledoux wrote the, the the book in which you arrive in your carriage which sweeps round to the underside of the house um which is all de- de- determined by the turning circle of the house and that sort of replaces like the gate and the cordon d'honneur yeah you go through the salon through to the sort of receiving dining and artistic room into the garden yeah and in a way we have a reflection of that movement through the building, out to the garden, but the garden is on the roof, which is the most intimate, the least heroic. Yeah. The most patio chair, having a fag. Like, you could go out in there in your dressing gown. We can take this out or leave this in, but I'll go through what the the classic Hotel Particulier one is. Yeah. This is the classic French urban palace, or mini palace. Of the... 15th to 19th century. Um, And the type changes, and it can go from... Haute bourgeois to aristocratic. Yeah. You have... it's And it's kind of like the Roman house. You have a courtyard, and you have gates to get into the courtyard, and this is the courtyard is tough, and around that house, at the bottom, there may even be shops and things like that, um, and it's service. Uh, everything important is on the first floor, basically. But you go through, and between that courtyard and the garden is the salon, which is a dual-aspect space, which is the reception room. Off that are the bedrooms and things. And then behind that is a garden, which is the intimate space, and there may be a little pavilion at the end. Yeah. And then at the first floor going round a, is another hierarchy. But essentially it's street, called on her, where people's carriages arrive, the ceremonial reception room, and then the gentle inner outer space. This layering of space. And, uh, and I think there's a relationship, not necessarily explicitly with that, but with something, it, it, with, with the sort of 19th century version of that, where you go... You arrive in your instead of carriage, your Citroen. Yeah. The under the cutout underside is, is is which actually isn't his invention. It's, it's a nineteenth century invention for carriages that you have the underside like that. Uh, get and then are swept into the salon, which in this case is the triple height space, through the circulation and out to the garden. I also think, by the way, that is universal to urban houses to the urban oh, yeah. elite no, housing. I was about to say that as well. Actually, I think that I think that just in housing generally, this. Um, the the layers of mediation between outside and inside, public and private. You know, I was at the... Um, who was it? Oh, yeah, it was Ryue Nishizawa of um, Sana doing a, a thing about how he does houses, which is obviously yeah. in a completely different cultural context and in the contemporary period, but it's... it's, it's they're very, very much, good. Yeah, very good. They're really one of... They are really one of the best practices... No, and his he he does some on his own as well, which are and they're very they're very interesting houses, and it, it's in in his case I think it's he phrases it much more in terms of inside and outside rather than public and private. But again, there's this kind of layering and consideration. Of What's really nice about the, the the that is is that um it's much more the um it's much more complicated than inside and outside in yeah. the hotel particulier, because in a way the two things kind of. Go, you go inside and outside and inside and outside. Yeah. There are very there are outside spaces which are very inside. Yeah. There are inside spaces which are really quite outside in terms of their their intimacy. Yeah. Yeah. What was it he was saying? Oh, he's calling it it's the buffer zone. Mm. The bu- the buffer zone is like the really charged. Yeah, which is the salon. Really charged area. Formally, this is quite interesting as well because I think it reads as. Um, Although it's very successfully integrated, it sort of reads as having lots of different parts. It's not exactly fragmentary, but it reads it reads as kind of. It's not fragmentary because every part is bridged, yeah, into other parts, and each part, when you're in it, when you're in a component of it, you're always looking onto the ways into and the other next places. Yeah, you're never. The spaces are never are, with the exception of a couple of little rooms in the in the flat, are never separated. They yeah. all run into each other. But it's dis- it's distinct from quite a lot of the other houses, which we'll see, which are really kind of like figured as, you know, unified. They're kind of yeah, sort of figures of of unity and 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 sort of simple perfection. Whereas this this reads very much more as um, a sort of uh, a convincing 
coordination of different types of forms and bits which have been brought together. I think it's at one end of a continuum yeah. like that with these houses. If you think of um, Villa Stein, it's kind of in the middle or... Um... Yeah. Uh, do you want to talk about the, 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 the series of um, technical failures? I mean, it's not super interesting. They... No, not really. I think we can just say um, well, he's incredibly cavalier. I want to say something about La Roche, actually, which is that he's... Oh, my um, God. He's a, an ex- my heart goes out to this guy. Uh, I cannot... Have you heard of an architect, a client who is better, a better client than this man? Yeah. Oh, the budget... Oh, you've flippantly spent masses of my money. That's fine. <laughs> oh, everything's... Oh, everything's pouring with water. Oh, you want me to live in it like a little monk? Oh, oh okay. Uh. He's very affable. He's a very <laughs> affable character, La Roche. Um, he... Uh, it's full of water. All of the walls cold bridge terribly to the point where they grow mould and all of the paintings are in danger. The solution of which is... And this is a real... I've, I've seen this done in terrible English houses. You just build another wall inside the wall. Which he did. That was, in fact, that was the point where he went against his architect's <laughs> express wishes. Yeah. He did that without his permission. But, yeah, you know, all the boiler broke. I mean, the, you know, all this kind of stuff happened. Um, but then I think probably the best moment is a few years later, he had the temerity to move his own pictures around inside the house. And Le Corbusier uh, wrote an article in a magazine criticising oh. him. <laughs> well, actually, it was almost immediately, and it was... Le Corbusier had thought there should really only be three or four paintings out, prominently his own paintings, yeah. but also a couple of Picassos. And, <laughs> and um, no Matisse. Matisse is very much... Very, is very, uh, he's, a, he's an insubstantial painter. And uh, he wanted to put most of his paintings on the walls. Yeah. And this was the problem. Yeah. He said, you put too many paintings out. It's quite something, though, to, to, like, uh, to and, go after your his client. His reply was, well, I, I'm a patron of several painters and I have a responsibility to them you included yes. to uh, display a work and you have made me a work of art but I did ask you to uh, make somewhere I could put my paintings yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes very sweet man around 1926 he constructed a house for his parents George and Marie who if you've listened to earlier episodes you will uh, recall uh, he had previously built a very large, unsuitable and expensive house for um, which they were forced to sell under financial duress. The Villa Le Lac is very modestly sized. It's beautifully located in a place called Corso, near, next to a lake. Um, and it was designed to be the house where they would live out their retirements, which ended up being of wildly divergent lengths. Um, his father, George, would be dead within a year, whereas his mother would live there for about 35 or 40 years. The villa serves two purposes, one of which is to try and restore some of his family pride, having so outrageously failed them previously, and try and get back in with his mother. And the other is to provide this contemplative, uh, like... A place of... No, no, I can do it again. Yeah? I've stuffed it up. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, it's pretty modestly scaled. Um, I, th- in, I think he is trying out a lot of ideas which he himself had about this rather monkish, or slightly austere, or certainly kind of unostentatious model of simple dwelling in nature. The house is an oblong... Yes, a bungalow, an oblong bungalow, four times as long as it's deep, four metres from the bank of a large lake, with a picture window running its full length, looking out. Yeah. And in it, essentially running along a single axis, are the necessities for a modest life. Um, I think the only enclosed room is the bathroom, and the rest of it is, is a run through a sort of harmony of four bays, all of which look out over the Great Lake, and it's surrounded by a little piece of land. It's very clearly a, a house for a simple life of lived lived in a sort of stunning and vast setting, which is the the kind of casual contemplation of the massive and infinite is is definitely a core monk fantasy. The view towards the horizon, the sun, over water, and the water, elemental forces. Yeah, it's a funny arrangement where the bathroom is sort of halfway between the kitchen and the bedroom. At one end, there is a sort of slight division of the plan along its length, 
where you have the kitchen face you have sort of some single aspect rooms but then towards the other end it really becomes much more of a um, of a, a sort of dual aspect box it's about 60 square meters he's starting to use color on the interior i mean that had also been a feature of um his earlier villas this selective sort of selectively painting one wall often really bright primary colors and actually uh he's always he's all, i think color has always been part of the palette yeah. uh it's just that all the early photographs are in black and white the fact that he uses color repeatedly surprised people through his life and now it has it has this sort of little baby version of itself which is really just a, a wall which frames it has a, an opening in it a big sort of um, rectangular window as it were which frames a um a view out over the lake so this is this even more austere place for which you to go have in. a roof it's like two it's two it's just the way that he can frame picture frame the view and it's got a sort of desk in it but no roof so this is a, uh, this is a sort of a twin of the monk cell we were talking about in the aux enfants studio there's a stair up to the roof you've got a little terrace on the roof there are various things to say about its effect. Its effect on the municipality uh, was to cause them to issue a ban on any future modern houses being built uh, in the area. Its effect on his father was that he died. Actually, the um, immediate cause of his death was being euthanised. <laughs> being euthanised, me. He also had stomach cancer. Yes. <laughs> but, yeah, well, so tell the euthanasia story. They just, they just like... um. They just poisoned him. With with morphine. <laughs> yeah, at the last... Yeah, without telling him. I mean, yeah, he was dying, but he might have gone on... Another few weeks. Quite some... Oh, no. Longer than that. Oh, right. Um... <laughs> it was for the best. <laughs> the doctor had said it was probably better that he had a hemorrhage soon rather than linger on for a number of months. And so they uh, took matters in their own hand. And that was the end of him. Make of that what you will. Yeah. And there was a touching scene. He said he was feeling sleepy and they came to his bed... Yeah. And um, Jeanneret lay down with him. He really mythologised this... Um... Said He said it was such a lovely um, moment to be by, you know. Well, he kind of possibly euthanised himself as well. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> like... <laughs> yes, that was very consistent of him. With the water yeah. and the little hut. There's an echo there, isn't there? He had, by this time, gone through the whole cycle of um, the difficult ego relations of domineering father and an egotistical son through to having achieved and enormously eclipsed his father, then regarding him as this sort of saintly, inspiring, distant figure. Yeah, 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 exactly. Like, yeah, yeah. sage-like, instead of, Not of this socially world, yeah. awkward. <laughs> yes, he said at the end, he spoke of nothing but the absolute necessities of life, is the quote. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> I need to go to the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah that's what I was thinking. It could mean that. Yeah. It, it could either mean, you know, my son. My son. Look after my family. Stay yeah. true to yourself. Yeah. Or yeah. I desperately need to get to the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't need to be said, or we've said it already, that there are all sorts of um, problems which bedevil this project on a technical oh, level. Yeah, yeah, the roof leaks, the heating doesn't work. It doesn't have a basement to flood. He is always arguing that the practical way to build is his way. But there was a reason no one did it like that, because it didn't work. Something he bumps up against for quite a long time. It eventually starts working. Flat roofs, I would say, start working in the 1990s. But the rest of it starts working. Concrete framing starts working quite quickly. They realise that you should stick some insulation somewhere. Either. If you want your building to look concrete on the inside and concrete on the outside, it has to be faked. Yes. Oh, those are wonderful, those details. Like, you can do some really elaborate Swiss ones, which I've never seen actually done, which is where you sort of, you have a concrete frame on the outside. And then you cast another one on the... Uh, like... No, no, you, and then you can, like, have, have, like, complicated joints with, like, impact polystyrene onto the, the plates. And you can have rebar going through the plate. Or you can just have your conc have all the concrete on the inside of the insulation. And then just like cement screed precast panels. Yeah, no, the Swiss ones are the ones I like, where you've got con concrete on the outside, concrete on the inside, and insulation magically somewhere in the middle. In it's the completely middle. mad. It looks mad. It's really yeah. You get a hell of a build up as well. Yeah. Good and thick. Yeah. Crash and a plane expensive. into it. Yeah. There's there's some great little villages in southern Switzerland where um, the one um had do you know um, Snotzi. It's not see, yes. I'm, yeah. yeah. Have you been to the village? No, I haven't. It's a whole village full of 
Better on brute concrete boxes. <laughs> some are by him and some by other people. But like we went there and um, you know the the woman in the who owned the off off license was like yeah. Uh, we asked her what she made of it. Yeah, well, I'm having one done, and there's a whole town of these like <laughs> mad, incredibly overspec. It's great. He goes. He sends his students around in the summer to take away all the road signs, and the oh. municip- municipality put them back up. He says Germans need signs, otherwise they fall into things. <laughs> he says they all go to Venice and fall in the canals. <laughs> While we're on the subject of his personal life, the other thing that happens is that he meets his wife. Uh, who... Yeah, he's met her a little bit earlier. Yeah. yeah, a little bit earlier. Yvonne. There's is some weird stuff. Right? There's some weird stuff going on. She never met his father. He did eventually let her meet his mother. Quite a while after they were married. She had a bit of a sort of background. Well, she was a prostitute. She was a model and a pro- and a shop worker, and she'd done a bit of sex work. Yeah. It's sort of the various proportions of these things. It's sort of not really clear. They, they vary. I think she was great fun. Yeah. Extremely unlike Le Corbusier. Yeah. The relationship seems slightly tragic. We never get any of her side of it. That's a, It's a problem, isn't it? It's a yeah. real difficulty reading it, because it appears that she's at home making home fun, and he's off doing stuff. And he's very patronising to her in letters and doesn't give her a lot of attention and is out in the world doing things. But, and she's an alcoholic as well. Well, she becomes an alcoholic. Yeah. It doesn't look good. Like, looking at the basic facts on the ground, it's impossible to know what was really going on. For me, it's not impossible for someone who, for example, did extensive research in the subject. Uh, but for me, it's impossible to know what's going on. And the sort of base evidence seems to be that he treated her very badly. The sort of facts on the ground seem to be that he um, he he treated his wife very badly for much of their life. I mean, he stuck by her, in a way, but yeah. like you can make a very easy join-the-dot story of they had a fun, briefly time together, uh, and then they got married, and she got stuck in the house, and he went out and had affairs... And around the world of architecture would occasionally come home. She wasn't able to be part of any of that world and then became an alcoholic and was sort of locked away. And he kind of comes back to her later in life. Oh, I don't know. That's cool, But you can certainly make that story. A lot of people have. It wouldn't be out of character for him to do that. I think he was rather controlling, wasn't he? He was controlling... He also didn't care at all about things that he wasn't interested in and got in his way. Or he could sort of persuade himself not to care. Yeah, about yeah. That. yeah. Inst- but like he can instantly overlook. I can't. We can't. I don't think we haven't gone into the personal stuff more than like reading articles and a biography and things like that. And it's difficult to quite disentangle it. You could see how the relationship would work when it was working, which is that she was bubbly and fun and naughty and exciting. This is a side of his life that he needed provided for him. His natural sort of life tendency appears to be day-to-day. He's sort of ascetic, can't quite look after himself, but likes a like steady home life, doesn't socialise much, works all the time. He was at home, needs... yeah. He was at home a lot. He was at home a lot, and he needs a home that's nice for him, but he's not really creating that house. And then occasionally would go forth and do things. And I think she could provide that house in a way in terms of making it fun. And he must have been an incredible guy, in a way. And also, kind of, there's a huge disparity of class between them. Yeah, I think that's a big part of the problem, is Um, that she can't really... She can't be a part of... Well, he he doesn't make her a part of it. Yeah. I actually think a number of the things he did in his personal life are completely unforgivable. I have no interest in forgiving him as a person. I think he was an absolute shit. This is one of them. I wouldn't say it's the... This is part of another, another, you know, I talked earlier, depending on how we organise the timing of this, about the, the strange relationship where you discover this building and you see this tremendous facility and talent in space, an immediate understanding of highly in-depth, complex spatial arrangements. Uh, also very humane. The and, buildings uh, seem very they're, humane. They're humane and they, 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 they have a... a, 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 a the, the spatial insight is inside of the person in the space. She's such a hard... Deeply, deeply empathetic. And it's this terrific facility for this. Uh, it just... And at the same time, in his personal life, 
and his business life and his politics. He's dreadful. He's a terrible man. He's just terrible. He's a terrible friend. He's a terrible husband. He's a terrible man in, in politics. He's a terrible businessman. He's a terrible liar. I'm sceptical about how much you can really know about what was going on in their relationship. It's sort of, it's difficult. He always, That's he'd, it. he'd obviously done, I think some of the things that you sort of read the way, you know, he would give her this kind of allowance, but it was in the, this incredibly patronising way uh, where she needed to get permission from an, uh, uh, their, like, accountant to spend any money. So it was, a, yeah, these, these kind of things really put you on edge when you read about them. At the same time, I think he was someone who was very, very naive about sex and relationships. And I can sort of, I can sort of see how a person like that might end up getting married to someone who they really shouldn't get married to and then being left in this sort of situation which is kind of intolerable but which also, for whatever reason, they're... In, unwilling to extricate themselves from and so you see this pattern at various points in his life where he goes on these very very long trips away to do various things including have affairs obviously but um just to sort of be away from his home life which is not working the problem i think maybe i you know there are some people who have the interpretation which is like um he treated her very badly and that made her an alcoholic but actually I did think that that's a bit glib. Actually, yeah, you don't really know. That. The things he did were because of the person he was. But I don't, I'm not interested in excusing anyone because of that. I'm also not interested in excusing him because he, because he made a bad judgment about who he'd get married to. There are a lot of ways of dealing with that that are enormously better than what he did. No, I'm not sure I'm... Ex- I don't yeah. think, I don't no, think, no, I don't think you are excusing him. I don't think I'm excusing anything. I think I'm sort of just staking out where I stand vis-a-vis the various kind of narratives of this that exist. I don't, I don't also pin my regard for him as a horrible person on this no. alone. I would say this is one of half a dozen <laughs> quite serious things. Well, I think that I think we might draw to a close there on, yeah. on that particular episode. Thanks very much for listening. Uh, there have been comments that you doing your um, mode of saying farewell is um, bursting some people's eardrums when they're listening, so... I said thank you. For, I was quite moderate there. <laughs> Thanks very much for listening. Um, do, do, do we want to say anything that? else? Do we want to say anything else? Um, we, oh, here's a really important piece of news. We're going to do loads of Le Corbusier episodes, but we're going to intersperse them with not Le Corbusier episodes. And we're not going to tell you when, because we haven't worked it out. That way, you, that way also you'll keep listening. Yeah. Um, uh, do you let us know what you think of the um, new Corbusier-based direction of the program. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm completely happy with it being a Corbcast, and um, no. Uh, but it just sort of happened, hasn't it? We got it's in. just very big. Yeah. Um, you can reach us at um, aboutbuildingsandcities at gmail dot com. It's lovely. We haven't had one for a couple of months. Yeah, we do love to hear from you. Uh, you can find us. We're uh, at about underscore buildings on Twitter and Instagram. Oh. Thanks, everyone, for your lovely reviews. I recently discovered that um, each country's reviews are inaccessible from each other. Yeah. So we've been reviewed in lots of places on iTunes. Yes. We've got lots of reviews in America. Yes. Thank you, friends. Thank you. We love America. And we have them in Canada. Yeah. And Australia. Yeah. And we have one in Germany. Yeah. Love Germany and Sweden. Yes. And probably other places. We love all these places. Have we got any in Andorra? No, we haven't. I haven't. (laughs) I did check. I checked every European country and we only had them in Sweden and Germany. For some reason, we are literally undiscoverable on iTunes in India. I think we might be uh, too obscene. Oh, you, even if you search for about buildings and cities, we don't, we come, don't up. come up. I might just take all the explicit tags off the episodes. I don't know. We can see because <laughs> some countries, some countries have restrictive laws, and they um, love to get listens in India. That's, just, that's exactly our sort of place. Um, not that all these other places aren't as well. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Maybe we could get. We could, maybe next time we could read some out. Yes. Yes. There's some good American ones. Yes. Normally saying things like that you say you haven't had any reviews, but actually I can see you've had lots and I've written one. But but we can't see any of them. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Well, I think that's a long enough digression on that. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye.